Okay, um, so it is now five o'clock. I'd like to welcome you all to the presentation of today. And today's presentation is educational uh, technology tools. And uh, our guest for today is Mr. Rob Schwantz. Mr. Schwantz, would you mind introducing yourself? Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cisneros. Yes. Uh... So Rob Schwant, my official title is Assistant Director of Educational Technology here at Alvord, um, a longtime Alvord member. Uh, you might have seen uh, my father's name around the district. He was a district board member before his passing. Um, and I'm happy and humbled to be serving here in Alvord in this role and uh, looking forward to uh, sharing some knowledge with all of you. So thank you for being here. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Schwant. And um, so, Mr. Schwant, if you have a, do you have a presentation that you're going to share? Would you like to share your screen? I do want to share my screen. I was actually calling up the last little bit of info here. Perfect. I am ready now. Beautiful. And for our uh, families, uh, what this presentation is, it's a, it's a conversation with the person himself, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Schwant. <laughs> And uh, what we're going to be discussing is what tools your students already have access to and you already have access to through your child's class link. Um, we are a one-to-one -one district, which means that every student here in the Albert Unified School District has access and has been provided with some sort of technology, whether it be an iPad or a Chromebook or a laptop. And um, through that, they all have access to something called ClassLink, which Mr. Schwant is going to be discussing. So we do have, there it is. Um, this is the landing page that your child will see. And Mr. Schwant's gonna um, kind of go through what the different tabs are. But I think one of the best kept secrets here in Alvord is tutor.com. Um, and so we're gonna be discussing that. We're gonna be discussing Parent Square, and also something that's, I believe it's this week, maybe next, it's Digital Citizenship Week. So um, I'd, like yes. to, I'd like to also remind our uh, families, si necesita esta información en español, en la parte inferior de su pantalla, verá uh, un globo, una esfera, que dice interpretation. Y ahí podrá cambiar el idioma de inglés a español. Si se une a través de su teléfono y no ve la esfera que dice interpretation, Tal vez verá tres puntos que dicen more o más. Y a través de esa herramienta puede cambiar el idioma a español. Uh, actualmente hoy nos está apoyando Ivonne. Muchas gracias, Ivonne, por estar aquí. No podemos hacer todo ese trabajo al nivel tan um, equitativo para que todas nuestras familias tengan acceso a esa información. Thank you. Uh, Javon Acosta, did you say all students can borrow an iPad or a computer? I'll uh, defer to Mr. Schwann to answer that. All right. Um, well, so it, the question is twofold. It depends on what grade level your student is in. Uh, so our students that are in third grade and above uh, all have should have access to a Chromebook that has been checked out to them, just like a standard textbook would be. So if they get a math textbook or a history textbook, a Chromebook should have been checked out to them by either by their homeroom teacher or by the library. Um, and so if you have a third grade or above student, they should have their own Chromebook. Um, but if you have a kindergartner, first grader, second grader, uh, they have Chromebooks that stay in their classrooms. So the teacher checks them out during that time if they're doing some sort of activity on their Chromebook. Um, to use at that time. As far as iPads, uh, iPads are available for specialty programs and uh, and certain uh, student groups, uh, usually on a limited basis. So, but yes, every student has access to a Chromebook. Uh, again, like I said, K through two, it's when the teacher decides to pull them out of the Chromebook cart in their classrooms and their third through 12th graders all have a Chromebook checked out to them to be used, obviously at the teacher's direction. Excuse me one second, I'm going to cough. I don't want to. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Schwant. Yeah. Uh, uh, Javon uh, Acosta, I hope that answers your question. So as he mentioned, from third grade and up, they can uh, get a book checked out, just like a textbook. Uh, and does go home, we asked. Uh, and, and, it, and I believe that in the uh, registration form and the data confirmation form, there is a, a acceptable use policy that our parents mm -hmm. agree to, to make sure that the technology that students uh, do have is used appropriately. 
And then for our younger scholars, TK through second, Mr. Schwant did just um, inform us that uh, they do have access to that. It just stays in their classroom. Thank you, Mr. Schwant. You're welcome. Should I continue? Yes, please, you're up. Okay. All right, so what you're viewing here um, is a screen that uh, your students have uh, become familiar with. Uh, once they turn on their Chromebooks and get signed in to their accounts, um, this is what, as uh, Dr. Cisneros explained, is the uh, ClassLink Launchpad. And for students, it's actually quite simple. Uh, they would just log in with their Google credentials. So let me go ahead and show you a screen that does that here. Let me click into this. There we go. So if I went to launchpad.classlink.com, now I'm typing it in, but your students, it automatically takes them to this page as soon as they open their Chrome web browsers. This is what it looks like. And for students, all they do is click the sign in with Google button. And it takes them to a screen that looks like this. So you'll notice that this particular student, which uh, is our, we, it's our demo account student, so demo Alvord the second, a fictitious person just for demonstration purposes, um, has access to these different applications. So you'll see a whole bunch of different icons here with their names. You might be familiar with them, uh, but more than likely your students will have used these products with their classes or with uh, a intervention teacher of some kind. Uh, so Adobe Express, uh, students have a quick access to Aries if they wanted to see their Aries account, check attendance and grades. Um, so CSTEM RoboBlocky um, is actually a free program for our students to get access to computer science and robotics uh, that some of our teachers are teaching here. Uh, so Gale uh, Database. So if your students are doing research for a, let's say a paper for their history class, health class, whatever it happens to be, these are actually databases for your students to get real authentic research uh, documents so that they can have peer-reviewed authentic text to pull from rather than just going on Google. So the Gale Research Database is very powerful. Um, and you notice here that, so as Dr. Cisnero said, tutor.com. So I've already clicked on it for demo here. And it's and after your students do this, they see a screen like this. So my hope would be, I guess one of the takeaways from attending this webinar or this, uh, this uh, Zoom call is that you as a parent can help your students at home with maybe something you're not too comfortable with. Let's say, for example, your student comes home with a difficult math problem. They're like, mom, dad, I don't know what to do. How do I do this math problem? Uh, and you're like, ah, it's been so long I've, since I've done math. I'm not, math is not my strong suit. So you, you or a student can log in to tutor.com you can obviously do it with them if you so choose. Uh, that's what we encourage you to do, especially for our younger ones, to uh, log in and it says, connect with the tutor right now. So if I were to click this button, it would say, okay, I can do it in English or in Spanish. I could select the topic. So I'm a, what's to say, I'm an elementary third grader through sixth grader. The topic is math. Specifically, let's say I'm in the third grade. I could do chat only, meaning you can just type along with the tutor or chat with voice, meaning you can actually speak to them. And notice how, again, the preference is based on English or Spanish. And you can take a picture of the problem, say, we need help with this math problem. Or you can type in the text of the problem. And if I hit it submit, it would actually take about 10, 15 seconds to start working with a tutor that is always available for your student to help your student with that particular math problem. Mr. Uh, yes, please. You said that this person is always available. This is, a, just to confirm, this is a 24 hour service? That's correct. So tutor.com, uh, so we have paid for a bank of hours so that your student at any time can jump on and there's tutors all over the world that speak English and Spanish to help out our students. Now, of course, we like we'll talk about with digital citizenship, we hope that you have structures in place at home so you don't have your computers out until 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. Um, but yes, this is a tutor that's available anytime. In fact, 
uh, I could speak for our middle schools and high schools. There are teachers that have uh, that let their students log into tutor.com during class time. Huh. So let's say they're done with a project early or the student is in a math class and their math teacher is helping another student, but the student has a question and they've asked their neighbors around them and they're not quite sure. They've looked at the textbook and they can't quite figure it out. They can actually log into tutor.com during class and try to get help with that question with an online tutor. That is so helpful. Um, yeah. I do have another question that comes up through these options. So uh -huh. the option is chat only and chat with voice. Is yes. the option to do a video call like this? At this time, no. Um, they would only, they don't want to do video calls. They, they At a time, there was, but uh, tutor.com has removed that video feature. And I actually, notice how it's with this grade here. I wonder if I changed it to middle school or high school math, would that change the option? It does not. So video is not available anymore. It used to be, but it's no longer. Yeah. I, I also think, um, you know, depending on the situation, I think that that would be, like a safety uh, trigger for, for us, our privacy trigger also for our families. So, so this way families, you're protected. Uh, mm -hmm. This way you're able to chat, so just type in the question, whatever the question happens to be. As Mr. Schwantz said, uh, you can attach a file, take a picture, or you can, uh, Mr. Schwantz, to clarify for, the, for me, chat with voices just like this, we're able to actually speak with a tutor, just not visually. Right, so pretend like you're talking to me right now without my video on, right? You can still hear me, yeah. but now you can't see me. Yeah, just like like I just um, turned off my computer screen, excuse mm -hmm. my computer camera, and we're still able to communicate. And if if I was having an issue with, you said math, or could this also help with essays? Yes. So there's connecting with the tutor for more of an immediate question. But here's the really cool one. So there's a section up here called drop off your work and writing review. So your students, let's say they're working on an essay for their class. They can actually have somebody after 24 hours will read their writing and give them some uh, suggestions or edits. So the student can actually have somebody that read their paper. So it could be you, the parent. Great. But I, it takes a lot of time, right? And uh, I know that we're always strapped for time. There's always something going on. So yes, one of the features, Dr. Cisneros, is you can click on writing review. And you just give it the information. So writing review grades K through six or seven through 12. What grade are you in? Let's just say I'm in sixth grade. When does the draft do? When's the final version do? What's the topic? Where are you in the process? So I think it needs a lot of work. Oh, I've gotten started, but I need feedback. Or I think it's nearly perfect. I just need just one other person to take a look at it. Describe your assignment. And then citation is very important. So most of the time we use MLA here in school, but there's other ones there. And then you attach your writing, your Google document or a PDF or a Word doc. And then someone at tutor.com will, oh, it says 12 hours now. They've improved. Look at that. So they'll get back to you within 12 hours. So let's say they were working on it at night. And then after they sleep, sometime during school, they'll actually be done reviewing that essay. That is very helpful. Yes. Uh, we have the, the live tutoring for maybe just shorter questions that they might have access to. Or mm -hmm. I said shorter questions, but that brings to, to mind, is there like a time limit? Like do they do 30 minutes at a time, an hour at a time with the tutor? Good question. So the connecting with the tutor now is designed for very short bursts, right? So it's not like you can book them. You're going to be at the same tutor for two hours doing work together. So connect with the tutor now is really just for, I had a quick question. They answer it. Okay, thank you. Bye. Um, but notice how I could schedule a session. So if you know you're going to come home and need support, Tuesday at 6 p.m. after your soccer practice, whatever it happens to be, you can actually look for a tutor specifically for uh, a particular subject. So like, let's go with our elementary example here. So a third through sixth grade math tutor. And you'll notice that the list will change. Again, next available, highest rated, number of reviews. So connecting one with now kind of does it randomly, but you can actually look for your favorite tutor. So students actually might randomly get paired with the tutor. And you might say, you know what? I really enjoyed Dustin, for example. Your students can actually look at Dustin's schedule 
and say, oh, I actually want to work with Dustin. He gets it. He understands me. Or we've done this math problem before. He can help me again. So this is something that your students can actually work on to work with Dustin, for example. Is there a, um, a limit on what subjects are available? Uh, I'm thinking that, you know, I was able to help my daughter all throughout her elementary, her middle mm -hmm. When she got to high school psychology, I was tapped out. I was confused. Uh, she was in AP psychology and I just could not follow along. Um, and we didn't have tutor.com uh, in you know, the high school where she went. So is there, is oh. there, I guess I'm, yeah, look at that. High school psychology, that would have come in handy. For us. And look and look at all these great tutors here. So this is just the list of people that have identified themselves as I could help with okay. psychology. So eleven times, let's just call it ten people. So one hundred and ten tutors. Wow, ready to go. That's amazing. And so it's it's available anytime is needed for any grade and any subject. Basically, yes. And and and, uh, and, and let's turn this into like one of those old infomercials and. and <laughs> The cost. Ah, oh, I'm so glad you asked, Dr. Snero. So uh, these are actually a bank of hours that the district has purchased. And so it is available to all students at any time. Uh, and it's free to you. So the district has already paid for these hours and for this access to these tutors. And we just need to use up the hours. And so they're available. So let's just say, well, what if my student uses too much? We don't track that. It's not like some student... So we understand that the educational journey, there are students who will need a little support and some who need a lot of support. And so it shouldn't be oh, only every student gets two hours and that's it. So it's whoever is, I guess, first come, first serve is the best way to kind of describe it. Um, and so, yeah, we want our families and our students to utilize this service. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, and just worth mentioning again, we'd really encourage our younger learners to do it alongside of a parent, right? So not only, yes, going to tutor.com is helpful and, oh, students go for it. And we would really encourage our parents to work alongside with the student um, so that you can be hearing the tips and tricks the tutors have so that you can uh, step in and also help your student by learning those tips and tricks as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shaw. My goodness. Um, this is all very exciting. And we have two questions that came up in the chat. Yes. Uh, does this also work for AP Calculus? Well, let's see here. So we were scrolling through. I saw math. Oh, Advanced Placement AP Calculus. Right. Oh, there's AB and then there's BC. So for Bianca, uh, your daughter would have to know, is she an AB Calculus or BC Calculus? It should be on her area schedule. We're right. pretty good at identifying that. Plug that in and then she could schedule a session or she could do, as Mr. Schwant uh, instructed us a little while ago, to do connect with a tutor now for that sh short, I just need one hour or excuse me, one or two questions. I guess then the difference for me, Mr. Schwant, would be connect with a tutor now is I'm having trouble on my homework right now and I need somebody to help me. Or right. scheduling a session is I know I have a test coming up. Let me schedule an hour or two with my preferred tutor. Is that correct? Right. Or again, you could just go by subject. So if I were to do advanced placement calculus, right, and then I could go to all the experts that are good at AP calculus. And and does the tutoring also happen in another language? You said Spanish. So even though the, so I guess that, uh, one part that I'm getting a little bit modeled up is the work that we're getting is in English. Um, but the tutors can translate that and help our, our bilingual students. Ooh, I do not see that as a filter option. And I'm looking here at the results and I don't see anything that says I speak also speak Spanish unless you're seeing something I don't. Would you be able to change the language up top? Let's see. Uh... Oh, that's not an option uh, for scheduling a session. Okay. Right. Oh, that's good. But it is uh, for connect with the tutor now. So well, let me... Uh, Let's click on Diego, for example. Let's say I wanted to schedule Diego. Okay. Um, let's see. Nope, there's no information here that says I can select Spanish. If, if Spanish is needed for our families or our students, it would be connect with a tutor now. 
and you can change the language. Um, okay, so then we have another question. Rosalba said, how do I log into tutor.com? Great question. So uh, for our students, uh, when they open up their Chromebooks or if they're at home and they have a home computer, uh, you, we want our students to go to this website, launchpad.classlink.com slash Alvord. So that is the link specifically for Alvord. So if you just typed in classlink.com, it would take you to the generic page. And it will take you somewhere that looks like this. And then you might say, oh, I'll click log in. And you could look for Alvord if you wanted to. Right? So, but no, so it's right there. So I click on it. It takes you to this page here. So I was just giving you the direct link to get here. And then all your students do, you'll notice that I closed that window, but it says up here, students, sign in with Google. So you would click that button there. Beautiful. Okay. So as soon as our students log into their devices, this um, class link is one of the first things that they see. It's so actually a tab that automatically opens for them. Beautiful. So as long as um, your, your child is able to get into their, their Chromebook, you saw the little T for tutor.com. Uh, Rosalba, and you'll just be able to click that. Yep, that one, and it takes you directly to it. Um, we have another question that came in. What mm -hmm. would be the method of communication with the tutor, chat or voice? And the answer, Mr. Schwann? So uh, it depends on what you select. So there, when you're connecting with the tutor, there's chat only or chat with voice. So you get to, de you get to decide how you'd like to chat with your tutor. The only um, restriction there, um, Oberezi, is uh, you will not be able to do video chat. And again, that's a, a privacy um, setting that we have for our, our students and our families. Uh, Mr. Schwant, would you be able to um, talk briefly about the test prep and self-study options? Yes. So this would be more for uh, our, uh, uh, I guess, uh, secondary uh, school learners, so middle school, high school. So taking a practice quiz it could apply to Again, most students, there's the SAT ACT, okay. which um, I know there's like after COVID, there are some schools who you don't have to take it. But now it's actually starting to kind of make a little bit of a comeback where colleges want you to take the SAT and the ACT, preparing for an AP test and okay. also video learning. So there's a video library of AP calculus. So let's just click on take a practice quiz. Select the topic. So this appears to be more high school based here. But so algebra and ink math fundamentals. Okay. Let's just go ahead and pick algebra one. And then here is the list of possible quizzes that we have here. I would have loved that as a as a teacher when I taught my students algebra to go in to be able to give them the opportunity to even um, prepare themselves and test themselves, get that extra practice. I also really love that for our high schoolers who are getting ready to take the SAT or the ACT or the AP exam, this is one more resource that they have available to make sure that they are as prepared as they can be because those tests are, are very challenging. Yep. And so here are all the different tests. So like we, we talked about AP calculus. So there's watching these videos to help you prepare. And these are probably video examples of these actual questions that would show up on the AP exams. Um, I'm sure everyone in this video would love to see some advanced AP calculus, but I'll spare us. Yeah, thank, thank you. Appreciate yes. that. Um, so uh, for Bianca, who asked about AP Calc, there is the scheduling the session. There is the connect with a tutor now. There is also this uh, self-study option. So it's a, it's a pretty complete, pretty comprehensive uh, system that we have. Fantastic, Mr. Schwann. Thank you for this information. No, you're very welcome. Um, parents, do we have any other questions for Mr. Schwann regarding tutor.com? If not, Mr. Schwann, I think you might be ready to move on to our yes. uh, uh, flagship application that we have here. Wow. Uh, parents, you're, so, you're so good with uh, nice adjectives. Uh, flagship, that is a good answer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> do, do we have any other questions for Mr. Schwann on tutor.com? This is very helpful. Mr. Schwann, you are getting good uh, feedback. You're getting good Yelp reviews. Oh, good. Well, I also hope I hear the uh, critiques of how I can be better. I would also appreciate constructive criticism. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schwann, I think our families are ready to move on to uh, Parent Square. Okay. So 
For Parent Square, um, here's the really cool thing about Parent Square is if you can log on to Aries, you can log on to Parent Square. So a lot of you have, uh, know what Aries is. It's the place where our students, that's where our uh, school schedules go. Uh, they can see their teacher and what classroom they're in. Uh, but Aries has now partnered with a communication platform called Parent Square. Um, and so if you know how to get to Aries, you know how to get to Parent Square. Uh, there's actually a here. Let me show you an example here. Um, let me just open a new tab. Let me need to move this over. There we go. So if I go to, uh, if I do a Google search, so if I type in Alvord Aries, notice how I type our district name first, because there are many districts that use Aries. Oh, not now. There are many districts that use Aries. Um, and so if you just typed in Aries into Google, there's notice how Placentia, Yorba Linda. You might say, oh, Aries, great. Uh, notice how there's Hemet. There's Irvine, San Bernardino City. So a lot of different school districts use Aries. Um, so if you're going to Google search it, always make sure you put Alvord in front so you get to the correct one. Uh, the other surefire way to get to it is to go to our main district webpage, alvordschools.org. Right. So, hey, look at this amazing drone footage here on the screen. I wonder who did that drone footage. Um, so if I go hover up the students and parents. There we go. If I have students, parents, notice how it says Aries portal. I can click there and now I know how to get. Here. So if you can log on to Aries, you can get the parent square. Um, so I'm going to log into Aries. Mine looks a little different than yours. because I go to an administrator page. I wish I can have a parent experience for you, but it's very similar. So I'm gonna type in my username, or again, you would type in your email address into Aries. Oh, I don't know how to sign in. Now I can get in, okay. So here in Aries, well, however you log in, my screen has a lot more information, but on the left menu, you'll see a button that says communications. And if you click on communications, it will take you to Parent Square, which looks something like this. All right, so this is the web version of it. Now, some of you, uh, you might be saying, does Parent Square have an app? Yes, it does. Uh, but in order to use the Parent Square app, you would need to set your password in the Parent Square app but the email address is the same as your Aries email address. So that's a couple of big things I wanted to make sure you knew. So, because I, I want you parents to hear that Parent Square has a lot of great information, such as, oh, look at this first post we're looking at right here at the top of the screen. EdTech Tools for Families, posted by Alejandro Cisneros. So he sends this information to you. A lot of you are getting it right now, probably through email. Fantastic. Uh, so by default, uh, if you've never logged on the Parent Square ever, you will automatically get emails to your email inbox. And it's the email address that is in Aries for your student. But the, what I wanted to show you is you have the power to actually change the way you're notified when Dr. Cisneros, myself, your school principal, your child's teacher, uh, when they make announcements or send you information, you can actually choose the way you receive it. So I, I briefly wanted to show you a way that you can uh, modify the way you're notified. Uh, but it all starts with you got to make sure you can get into Parent Square. So Dr. Cisneros, if you can monitor the chat and see if there's anyone that would need assistance logging in to Parent Square, that'd be fantastic. As of right now, there's nothing in the chat, Mr. Schwamp, but I, I think you really touched on something important is managing how our parents prefer to receive the communications. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard feedback that Parents Square just sends a lot of emails, Parents Square, you know, just sends a lot of notifications. So for our families uh, that are having that experience, uh, what we don't want is to overwhelm our families with emails. Right email or notification after notification. So I'm very uh, thankful that you'll be able to show us 
how to manage that. Uh, yes. Kind of control the flow. Right. So I'm on the web version. I know a lot of our parents will probably use their phones. And so I will go also into showing you screenshots of how you would change it on your phone. Uh, but for the web version, and even on the phone version, it's very similar. You would need to go to your uh, account up here at the top. So mine says my name, Robert Schwant. Uh, and if I click on it, there is my account. So on your phone apps, you would need to go to my account. Takes a little moment to load here. So I have a whole bunch of roles here. So I'm an administrator at all of our schools here in our district. But you should hopefully see that you, it's a, like it has the school of, that your child attends. If you have multiple students, you'll see multiple schools. And it also has the email address. It might say parent of and your student's name. And then the email address that's in Aries. But you'll notice here on the left-hand side, I have notification settings. So even if, again, I have a lot of different ones because I'm an administrator here in the district, but you should see notification settings. And if I click on notification settings, for each school that my child attends, I have some different options here. So remember I referenced Demo Alvord the second, that fictitious student at Hillcrest High School. Notice how for Hillcrest High School, uh, I can choose how I want to get uh, general announcements and messages. So this is applies to posts only. So for example, you saw Dr. Cisneros uh, made that post about this, this webinar you're watching right now. So most of you got this email digest. So it's an email that comes around six o'clock at night. Um, and it's all the information that was sent to the, to the, the community throughout the day. So let's say the principal sent out uh, something about back to school night or parent teacher conferences at 9 a.m. Uh, your child's teacher sent out a uh, notice at 12 p.m. about a class party coming up. And then at 3 p.m., the after school program sent an announcement about uh, making sure to wear closed toed shoes. So rather than getting three different emails from your principal or from your school, you would get one email with all three of those like announcements in one email. So that's what the digest does. Uh, and I know a, a question that you might come through is, well, Mr. Schwant, I get a lot of messages from my school. Um, and I don't, it doesn't just come at night, it comes during the day. So schools have the ability to send out what's called alerts. And alerts, those get sent immediately when the principal or the administrator sends them. So that is different than posts, which I know is kind of confusing and I don't want to get too much in the weeds there. But if you're getting text messages or emails um, from your principal and it seems to be coming at all different times of the day, it's because your principal wants to make sure you get that notice right then and there. Uh, and that is something we are building. We're building our protocols for the district of how frequent we send out alerts and notices as opposed to just making a post so that we're not inundating and overwhelming our families with a whole bunch of messages. Uh, but anyway, back, back to point here. I can choose if I want to get an email. So I can turn it off if I want to. I don't want to get no notifications by email. I actually want to get a text message. So notice how for Hillcrest High School, whenever they post something, I will get a text message with that information. And it says instant, meaning if the teacher or the principal or the secretary post something at 10 a.m., I'm going to get that text message at 10 a.m. Now, the last one over here is the app. So the app, if you have it downloaded on a smartphone, uh, would send a push notification to you um, either at that moment, like for example, 10 o'clock when the secretary sends out a uh, reminder, or digest, meaning at 6 p.m. you'll get a push notification and you just check the app at around 6 p.m. and you can see all the messages uh, that you saw that you uh, came out during the day. So that is how you would change your preferences um, to uh, get information when you want it. So turning off emails and only having text messages or turning on the app, turning off texts and emails, it's up to you, but you can uh, change that if you want to. And of course, if you needed to look at your account and look at all the information there, such as where you're associated to, 
and making sure you have your correct phone number. Again, we recommend that if you want to change an email or a phone number, you do that Aries because Aries sends all that information to ParentSquare. So make sure if it if you're looking at it here and you want to edit your contact info, don't change it here. You want to make sure you change it in Aries. Very important. All right. So that's all I wanted to kind of share about ParentSquare. There's so much more, but I did want to get into cybersecurity. So I will pause if there are any questions regarding ParentSquare. Uh, no, I think you did a really good job of going through how to change that. Uh, the one other question that I would um, like to see if you could address is how are parents able to communicate with um, school staff through ParentSquare? Ah, I'm so glad you asked. So uh, here in the main screen, so I clicked on home to get back here, which on the phone app, I'll show you a screenshot a little bit later. Um, so this is the general announcements that are made to the school by the principal or, again, district administrators like Dr. Cisneros. So if I scroll down a little bit, um, this is a feed personally for me, by the way. So you aren't receiving every single thing in the district. You're only receiving messages that pertain to you and your students. So Dr. Cisneros posted here about EdTech. He also posted here about the CalFresh application assistance. Uh, uh, Alvord Adult School, the Community Event Flyer, right? So there's a whole bunch of different posts that you can scroll through and you can see all the information. But Dr. Cisneros specifically asked, how do I communicate? Let's say I have a question for my child's teacher. Um, they had a question about homework or a deadline or when something to turn in, what's the best way to turn things in. Uh, at the bottom of the phone app, there's a menu option for messages. So over here on the web version, if I click on messages over here on the left menu, right? So here are all the messages that you can send. So I'm attached to La Sierra High School, so I'm able to send a new message to the teachers that my child has. So if I wanted to send it to his second period teacher, if I'm in middle school or high school, or I'm an elementary school student, I want to send it to their third grade teacher. You can. So you just click on new message and you can send it to the teacher. Um, and so this is acts like a text message. So just like uh, you can get a text to your cell phone number, or it could be a message in the Parent Square app. Okay. So there's a, that's how the messaging works. So think of it as a text message, but it's a secure message, meaning you have to log in to see it. So you wouldn't be able to uh, view the contents without actually having been signed in or going into the app. But this is a very powerful way to communicate with your child's teacher in a way that they will communicate with you. And one of the cool benefits of messages, let's say your home language is Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, whatever it happens to be. It will actually, if you set your preferences, so let me go back here. I should have shown you guys that. My apologies. So back in my account, if I go to language settings, you can actually change it from English to one of these other languages. So if you speak another language at home, you can actually receive messages and language or uh, communication in your preferred language. So if the teacher types in a message in English, you'll receive it in your preferred language. It will translate for you and vice versa. If you write a message in your preferred language, let's just say German, uh, if you typed it in German, the teacher would receive it in their preferred language. English, Spanish, whatever it happens to be. So that's a really powerful thing for messages. So no, we don't have to worry about being lost in translation or having to translate it elsewhere. You can actually use Parent Square and it will translate for you automatically. So a really, really cool feature there, messages. I think that um, I just want to say thank you for highlighting that for our families who... Mm -hmm. um, who aren't proficient in English. Uh, we have our interpreters um, in the district, Yvonne being one of them to help them through these conversations. But uh, when they're doing texting and messaging with their teachers or their principal, whatever school personnel they're messaging with, 
they're able to just write it in Spanish, write it in German, write it in Vietnamese. Parent Square has tons of languages and it automatically gets transferred. They, the teacher then responds in English and it automatically gets translated. I think that's such a powerful, uh, right. thank you. Thank you for that. No, of course. So that's, I mean, there's so much more to Parent Square, but uh, those are the, when I was thinking about this presentation, I wanted to make sure I had those two things because Parent Square can be a really valuable tool, especially to make sure our parents get connected to their schools. And so those are the couple of things I wanted to highlight. 100%. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. All right. We got about 20 more minutes, sir. So you're doing really great on time, a third, a third. And let's go to the final third, which is digital citizenship. Yes. So um, our schools partner with Common Sense Media. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this service before, uh, but Common Sense Media is a nonprofit organization uh, that essentially wants to make sure that educators and parents can help students kind of grasp the idea of like, so if you, for example, you know how in movie theaters, when you go to the movies, like there's ratings for it, right? PG-13, PG, rated R. Um, and most of us, like when we hear that, we understand, oh, that means if my child, if rated R movie, oh, you have to be 17 in order to go in. Or it basically is a warning to you that if it's a rated R movie, there's probably some language or um, imagery that might be very kind of uh, problematic for younger viewers, right? So you understand that there's a rating system for movies. Um, but there's so many more things now, because movies were a thing, and the only kind of like visual media we had for a long time. And now there's video games, TikTok, Instagram, right? And so there's so many more ways to consume media. And for parents, it's so difficult to keep up with it all, right? Once you think you figured it out something, something else comes up or the new thing seems to become popular. Uh, and so Common Sense Media came about to help parents and educators now uh, what is this thing that kids are talking about? Like, what is this app that's coming to the, like, that's going on? And they actually will give you some resources to help you have a conversation with your student about that particular app. So if I click on for parents here, right? So notice how if I go to movies, TVs, books, games. So let's say I wanted to look at a movie, right? Should, should uh, my child be watching this movie? The first thing it asks you is, how old is your child? So let's say eight years old. It will give you suggestions on movies they could watch, right? And so notice how Common Sense Media gives it ratings. So for eight plus, for 13 plus, for 10 plus. So it kind of gives you a peace of mind of, hey, should my child be watching this? Or all the kids, my son came home, my daughter came home and said they were watching the show. Is this actually good for my kid? So let's just click on the wild robot, for example, right? So you'll notice that it's a movie, it's PG, um, and it's recommended for eight and over, right? And so how do we rate? So this one is done by this particular person. What parents need to know. So if I click on this, it will tell me all these. So why, uh, why a plus? So then it will tell you. So there are parts of the movie where several animals die, uh, mostly off camera. But the positives, they're strong messages, uh, diverse representations. Uh, notice how it says there's no sex, romance, romance, nudity, drinking, drugs, smoking. Um, so just to kind of give you a little bit of context of, hey, like, what is my child watching or what are they doing? Uh, so this is a movie, but it does the same for games, uh, does the same for podcasts, does the same for apps, does the same for YouTube channels. So this is really a powerful way for you without having to <laughs> kind of like watch the videos yourselves to figure it out. There's a third party or a, a nonprofit company that will help you make those decisions or figure out what your kids are watching. And then you'll notice that there's this like parent tips and tricks here. So for by age, by particular topic and by platform of uh, best things to make sure you do or consider as a parent to help your student learn healthy digital habits. All circling back to digital citizenship. So if I click over here, so our all of our T 
teachers, K through 12, uh, every month uh, will be working with your students to help them be better digital citizens. So basically that means in this world, right, like we're seeing each other right now through Zoom. You are actually a digital citizen of the internet, right? When you logged on to this Zoom call, uh, you turned on your cameras or turned them off. You had your microphones on or off. And there's almost this expectation that, oh, I'm going to be respectful and make sure I listen carefully to this presentation. Uh, I'm not going to distract others. Uh, and I'm going to be really attentive. Now, where did you learn those values? Or how did you know that that was the right thing to do? Now, you could say, oh, well, I've taken a class on this before. But most of us have learned these habits or these rules or these expectations because that's what was expected of us we saw we witnessed it in our homes or when we were in school and so how are we teaching students these behaviors or expectations uh i you're probably doing it in your own home but for a lot of us i mean as, as older people computers weren't as ubiquitous and around everywhere so how do we help students learn those same kind of rules and expectations, but in a digital world? So this is a way, this is the company that Alvord has partnered with to help teach our students to take ownership of their digital lives. It says it right there in the middle of the screen. So there's lessons available that our teachers are going through, but there's also resources for you as parents to have these kind of conversations with your students about whatever topics we talk about here at school. It also helps you build resources and a guide of what does it look like in my own home? What kind of questions should I be asking my students about how they behave online? So notice that these are the kind of the big topics up here. So media balance, online privacy, digital footprint, communication, cyberbullying, and news and media literacy. Um, news and media literacy this is a big topic right now, especially with the upcoming election here in about a month. Uh, but this is for educators. So uh, this, this particular page I'm on, but it's broken up into different grade bands here. So let's say I click on this third through fifth grade. Your teachers have these already made lessons for their families or for their students to go through and actually look at so we talked about news media and literacy. So is seeing believing. Why do people alter digital photos and videos? So you might know this or not, but what you see on Instagram or what you see on TikTok isn't always real. There are things called AI generators uh, that can generate content that looks really authentic, but it actually isn't. Um, but this particular lesson goes into, well, we see a picture on Instagram, on TikTok, on Twitter, and we see that, oh, it looks perfect or, oh, it's really nice. But is that really the real story? Is that the real picture? Um, and so teachers will actually start these conversations with students inside class and not to, again, indoctrinate or say, like, this is what you should do, but just asking questions. But what does it look like for families when... Um, when they come home, right? So how do you continue the conversation about what they're discussing in school? So this week, and I'm glad Dr. Cisneros brought me on this week, is Digital Citizenship Week. It's the recognition uh, that, again, it's so important that we need to dedicate a whole week to talk about these particular skills and these particular ways we can be better digital citizens. Uh, so going to the elementary calendar, like I mentioned here. Uh, so if I look into this calendar, you'll notice that Every day this week, teachers are going through these lessons with their students. Uh, so for today, looking at managing device distractions. And notice how when I go home, I have a conversation starter. Let's take a look at that. So this is a document that you can have access to to have this kind of conversation at home with your students. So asking these three questions. I hear you learned about digital distractions in school. Tell me about that. I also heard you talk about about the things that make it hard to stay focused. Do you remember any of the digital distractions your class came up with? And it even gives you hints as parents, opening up apps and games or tabs on their Chromebook, wearing headphones when someone's trying to talk, hearing notifications on their smartphones when they're trying to stay focused. And then this last question, what are some things we can do at home to help you avoid distractions? Right, just asking that question so that 
uh, the student is a part of it. It's not just you as the parent. This is what we're doing. It really encourages a conversation between you and your student, which is really cool. And then notice how it says use the family tech planner to talk about screen time as a family. And you can use this to set rules to make your child the most of entertainment and tech time. So this is just one example of a great way uh, that you can help your student learn healthy digital citizenship habits and then also talk about this topic at home. And what does that look like, not only just for your student, but maybe for you or your other siblings or other family members that are in your home so that you can set the tone of making sure you have healthy and safe digital citizenship habits. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure I shared. So it's called commonsense.org if you go to their main website. And again, I'd really encourage you to check out, especially the first thing I talked about, uh, making sure if your child brings up a movie or an app or a game, uh, you can get a uh, unbiased third-party kind of look about what it's about and uh, so that you could be more informed. All right, thank, thank you for that, Mr. Schwann, because I know that there's so much new content that gets generated. And I remember when I was... Um, when my daughter was younger, my daughter's now 19, but we would sit and sometimes we would watch YouTube together. And, you know, you search for something that's innocent. At the time, she was really into Dora. But Dora the Explorer videos that are on YouTube aren't always authentic Dora the Explorer videos. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for us to, as parents, to really filter through what's appropriate and what isn't. So I'm thankful that you said that even to the level of YouTube channels that are students and our children might be interested in we could go in and see you know is it appropriate is it not what are the ages video games i know that you know we were all younger and so you know we get away with things that we can get away with right and so mm. this is just another tool that uh parents you now have available to make sure that your children are being safe online uh so thank you for all of this mr schwan mr. you're welcome we have a, a question that came in from celeste uh, regarding um, Tutor.com. So yes. what, is, is Tutor.com through the district or something separate? Um, so it's, it's purchased by the district, but it's a separate entity, correct? That's correct. So yeah, um, at the time it was uh, the Princeton, yeah, the Princeton Review. Uh, they're a big company that actually their uh, focus what is and was on uh, test prep, um, but they have... Uh, now branched into this kind of like online tutoring service. So you, this is a uh, service that the district has paid for um, and it's available to all students. They can log in and they're able to get the help and the support they need with their studies. Beautiful. Thank you for that, Mr. Schwantz. Mm -hmm. um, great. Uh, we have just about seven minutes left in the hour that we have um, scheduled for this presentation. I'd like to uh, open it up to parents. Do you have any additional questions for our guest, Mr. Schwant, either on tutor.com, on Parents Swear, uh, or on digital citizenship, or really any anything else that's regarding educational tools and technology? Mr. Schwant, you did such a fantastic job that there are no questions, so. Wow, well, I, I Thank you for being so kind, Dr. Cisneros. But I know that there are um, a lot of things we could ask, right? And what's appropriate to ask in this large group. And I know for especially for digital citizenship um, in regards to that, that's there's a lot of uncertainty because how do you start now, right? Like, let's say you feel convicted as a parent of I should really be better about making sure my child has less screen time, or I should really be more informed of the things they're watching or playing. And so, But how do you start that new, like, okay, I need to be more vigilant or more aware. Um, and so rather than saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to start watching you. Uh, my advice to you parents, and just take it for what it's worth, is just start asking questions like, hey, what are you watching? Or tell me more about that. And I, I feel like the student's usual response is, oh, if you start talking about it, then it's not cool anymore, <laughs> right? And then there's like kind of like walk away from it. And so it's probably for the better. But you'd be surprised of how 
like if you show interest maybe in something they're interested in, it could open up a whole door of conversation with your student. And once they start giving you more information, then you can then take that to something like Common Sense Media so that you can learn more about it um, and see if it's appropriate for them, number one. But number two, it could lead to richer conversations about uh, whether uh, (laughs) the YouTube channel's whole goal or uh, maybe just thoughts and considerations about how much time they're spending on these things. Uh, So I see raised hands. I saw a couple of chat messages. Uh, Lou, this, would you like to uh, unmute and ask a question? Lou, this was money. You raised your hand. There you go. Sí. Adelante. Sí, hola, buen, buenas tardes. ¿Puedo hacer la pregunta en español? Por supuesto. Este, me acabo de mudar a la Eduzai, al, al, al distrito, y yo no he podido abrirme cuenta de Aries. No, la cuenta de Aries porque estaba yo estaba yo en Garden Grove y no puedo checar la ¿cómo se dice? Sí, ¿cómo le diré? ¿Cómo le explico? Este, tengo la app de Aries, pero pero no sé por qué no me deja entrar a ver las las calificaciones de mis hijos o Ah, sí. Bueno, este, sé que lo que puede hacer en, um, permíteme un segundito, déjeme um, decir la pregunta. So the question, Mr. Schwant, is uh, Lourdes just arrived to Alvord. Welcome, Lourdes. We're glad to have you here at Alvord. Yeah. Uh, she came from Garden Grove, and in Garden yeah. Grove, she had the Aries application, and now she's having trouble logging into her Aries here in Alvord. Um, for that, is that something that the school office can support with? Yes. So your best point of contact for anything Aries related is to go to your child's school site. Um, and the one of these secretaries should be able to help you with finding your students' uh, information. Uh, of course, you have to provide identification. And then they'll be able to support you with, here's the email address that is on file so that you can log on to Aries. And just as a general rule for everybody, uh, you're able to reset that password as long as you have access to the email. So if you go to that Aries login page, let's go back here. And if you don't have access to the email, then make sure that you talk to your child's school and they can um, just change the email if you got a new one. Yes, but your 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 school would the school needs to do that. So once right. you're here and you confirmed you're on the Alvord page, you would just need, click on forgot password, and then you would email that whatever email address that is, and then you would get that reset password email. Uh, we did. Thank you, Mr. Schwant. Um, Lourdes, eso le da respuestas pregunta. Does that answer your question? Uh, sí, ya hice eso. Lo hice cuando entraron mis hijos ahorita que empezó el año. Pero mi pregunta es, tengo a lo mejor tengo que borrarla y volverla a hacer como usted explicó ahorita hace un momento, como lo Muy bien, este, bueno, um, for those specifics, para esa uh, ayuda específica, uh, go to your child school and the child school can, can help you through that. Thank you, Lourdes. Um, ok, está bien, sí, gracias. A usted. Um, for tutoring, we got a question from Jewel. Uh, thank you for privacy of no video. However, uh, can the student send a screenshot or photo of the topic? I answered uh, yes to that. Um, and then uh, what I wanted to share right before we end off, we have one more minute, is that Mr. Schwann's uh, presentations are so fantastic, so dynamic. Wow. That, uh, we got him booked for two weeks in a row. So if you notice, we are here on educational technology tools. And next week, next Wednesday, uh, he will be presenting on digital well-being in honor of and to align with digital citizenship. Uh, So we are just uh, about uh, halfway through our series of the first semester virtual workshops. Remember that we have a lot more to go through. Um, So just as you came online today through your parents where, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, or if you just received the link with um, with the text message that I sent out, 
Um, please uh, join us if you ever need to say, hey, I, I thought it was really good information, but I forgot what the specifics are that you know, whatever the presenter happened to be said, go to our Alvord YouTube page. And these are uploaded a couple of days after the presentation happens. They're always there available for you. Uh, Mr. Schwann, thank you so much for being here. I'd like to give you the last words. Is there anything else you'd like to say in closing? No, I just appreciate the opportunity to spend time with you parents. Uh, that's, I mean, the function of my job is, of course, to support your students, number one. But number two is to support you as parents working with our students. Um, and so thank you for allowing me to partner with you. Um, my office in educational technology uh, wants to partner with you to support you and your students. And I hope these tools uh, prove useful to you. Uh, and if you need to get a hold of me, um, the best way to do it, I'm sure Dr. Cisneros will uh, put my contact information somewhere for you, uh, but uh, you can uh, feel free to reach out to me by email and I will get to get back to you as soon as I can. I'm doing your email in the chat right now, robert.schwant at albertschools.org. Is that correct? That is correct. Beautiful. And as always, I just want to give one final shout out and thank you to our interpreter, uh, Ms. Yvonne who uh, helps our Spanish speaking families make sure that they have access to all of the information. Thank you so much. Everybody have a good night. We'll see you and Mr. Schwant next week.